So I'd like to welcome you tonight to uh, a repeat, actually, and and Dana has been very gracious in uh, in agreeing to give this talk live again instead of just a recording, just because we had so many uh, problems the last time, the tech difficulty, and uh, so I asked her if she would be kind enough to give us a repeat, and she has graciously agreed. And so um, for those of you who failed to catch it the last time, we are um we'll, we'll jump right back into it uh so so uh, what is the thing with mulberry trees in uzbekistan uh first of all it's a silk road so we know that you know everybody we're, we're so enamored of the silk road uh, it's a fascinating fascinating region and the one thing that that one feature of the Silk Road that ties it all together is uh, the mulberry trees and particularly so in Uzbekistan. So uh, Dana is going to take us behind the scenes of how mulberry trees have, uh, have spawned this culture of trade and cult uh, commerce throughout the Silk Road over the years, over many, many centuries, and how it spawned sericulture, the gorgeous ikats, one of which I'm wearing right today. Uh, and she'll take us behind the scenes also to learn about how some of the finest paper in the world is made from the mulberry trees. Uh, she'll also take your questions afterwards. And um, I'll just say a few things about Dana. Dana is our EYHO trip leader to Uzbekistan. There is a tour coming up in, um, in October, in mid-October. I do not know whether we can actually go. It is, it is an almost sold out tour, but uh, we are keeping fingers crossed that we can go. Uh, certainly they're very ready for us, but obviously we are not going to go until it's totally safe for us and for them. And um, so uh, we're hoping that we can go. And if we do go, Dana will be leading this trip. And in her words, Dana says, she has a lifelong fascination with fabrics and especially ikats leading and has led textile focused trips to Central Asia uh, and a, a full-fledged obsession with its people, cultural landscape and legends. She first traveled to Uzbekistan in 2013 and has since returned several times. And she wants to make a full disclosure. She says she's a 10% scholar of textiles and Uzbek history. She, and she has, she's an 80% enthusiast. And she also has a 10% fondness for oddities and oxymorons with a tendency to romanticize. And I can tell you in my words that Dana is far too modest. Her deep knowledge and love for Uzbekistan is is only is offset only by her passion for all things Uzbekistan. So I welcome Dana. There we go. Are you seeing the presentation? Yes, I, I oh. see it. And I, if okay. you if you can't see it, please put it on chat for me. Show show show chat. Okay. Yep. I think okay. everybody yeah. can. And uh, so if okay. any of the participants can't see it then please put it in chat for, for me. Yeah, and I will okay. see to it. Yeah, okay, All great. right, and let's go to slideshow so you get a larger view. Um, so when Sheila asked me to um, prepare a talk about Uzbekistan, um, I immediately did sort of the travelogue and she said, no, let's do something that has a little bit more of a theme to it. And I mulled that over because there's so many possibilities. And I thought that particularly in the context of, of textiles and crafts, um, that the mulberry tree um, would be a good theme. And this photograph that you're seeing right now, that is an older tree. And what I loved about this image is that it shows some of the old fortress walls um, that are made from, from mud. And um, that I not including anything about the fortresses and the, the Silk Road caravanserai, um, but just a little taste of some of what is there. So as Sheila alluded to, um, the mulberry tree 
obviously um, being on the Silk Road, originated in China. But the theme here really is that the leaves provide food for the silkworm. So it is the basis of the sericulture, um, where you get the silk for thread, fabric, carpets. Um, mulberry fruit um, is also a product. Um, the branches, um, both with leaves, although you don't get many of those because they are used for the silk, um, but they're, the branches after they've been denuded by the silkworms um, provide fiber for paper. And just another little aside that we'll go to in the end is that the pupae themselves are a source of pre protein that are used um, in a variety of ways. Um, this one of the things that's remarkable about um, the mulberry tree is that it's very adaptable. It grows in, in really most conditions. Um, Central and Eastern Uzbekistan are, are very dry, although it gets can get very, very cold in the wintertime. Um, and they do extremely well there. Um, you can see the most common species. I can't really tell you anything about that. This is where um, my 10% scholar will show. The fruit, unfortunately, um, is too fragile for commercial production. Um, and so it's, it, it's eaten locally during the season. It's, it's nutritious. Um, it's obviously very pretty. Um, and I've never tasted it. And if anybody has and has a comment about it, um, please share it on the chat. This, I'm gonna show a quick YouTube um, about the harvest of silkworm. I, it, it does better at explaining it than I think anyone can. So hold on. <laughs> Kech kecha harakat qilish kerak. Mahal to'r mahal kamida barq solish kerak. Tillani tillani bajarishimiz kerak 60 kg dan korobkasiga. Tillani yaxshi bajarsak o'zimizga yaxshi, oilamizga, oila byudjetiga yordam. Hazır şimdi şarayt var eken, üç metre tüseyim şarayt var eken de, tutlarımız hem yeter eken, ondan ki egin daromatımız gelen yakışı bolar eken, birinci navbette, ben şu bir metre tutkanımızı uzun bir yıllık istajı bolar eken, bana bunun faydalı tamamını şu, üde oturup eken ayollarımız bu arada, bu şu ayollar eken hayatta faydası katta, hem istajı bolar eken, yerdeki pençeye çıkan da, İş stajları tuğluk buladı.
Bugün bana pillemizde haşar, haşar geçerli koştularımızı, kardeşler, mahalle degiler çakırdık haşar ge. Pillemiz bana buldu bu yüge bugün. Bu da halası karıp kesige altmış yetmiş. Karıp tapşır mahçımız. Okay, let's wait. Let's see, I need to get back to all right. Uh, just a couple of notes. Um, you saw that they showed very high quality um, cocoons, and you may have noticed um, the metal teeth of the women. Um, historically. Um, when you had dental work done, you were given gold. Um, obviously that's not affordable. And so they have an alloy that they use that is somewhere between a bronze and even a little bit of a coppery color. And it's, it's considered status um, to have had dental work. And so there is no effort um, to try to hide it or anything. And sometimes it's a little surprising at first when, um, you're greeted by somebody with this big grin and it's this huge metal grill. Um, but once you get used to it, it you begin to see, see the beauty in it. So the silk economy um, in Uzbekistan, it is, it's a hard cash commodity and it's a strategic asset. Um, and so as she talked about earlier, you know, the, the cost of producing it at the local level is, you know, incredibly inexpensive whoops, compared to the, you know, the um, cost that it yields on, on the world market. They currently do, um, well, I should say I haven't looked at the data recently um, during COVID, but pre-pandemic, pre about 75% of the silk, um, either in thread form or in fabric, is exported. They would like to develop um, more and more of it um, as, as a form of attracting um, investment. And they also want to introduce new strains of mulberry as well. Um, as some of you may well know, cotton has been a large export um, commodity for Uzbekistan, highly political because um, during the former administration, um, there was forced labor during the cotton harvest and everything closed down. Um, schools closed down, Doc doctors and teachers, everyone was required to do um, manual labor in the harvest. And there was child labor, which was, um, you know, uh, reviled internationally. Uh, they say that there is no longer forced labor. Um, previously, you were not allowed to take any pictures of cotton fields ever, regardless of whether or not harvest was going on. Um, because of water conditions as well, it's a very thirsty crop. Um, they are becoming less reliant on cotton. So it is, so silk will continue um, to play an important role in the economy. Um, the Yodgorlik Silk Factory in Margalon of the Fergana Valley, a place um, that's included on the tour, um, gives, gives people an opportunity to see the hand production of silk fabric. Um, and there's also a little workshop, a hands-on workshop that participants get to do. But here you see they're doing some of the sorting and this is obviously not the highest quality. And again, a lot of this is really for tourism purposes um, when it comes down to the, the production in higher volume, um, a different, a, a more mechanized process is used, however, not at Yad Gorlick. And you'll also, see these velour gowns. Um, this is very common. This is considered um, 
very current fashion for more traditional women in Uzbekistan. Um, and the more bling on it, the better. Some of it is, is, is rather garish. And I sometimes think that they tend to look at the tourists. We tend to be wearing um, single color, um, more practical things so that we can show off the scarves that we buy. Um, and we look quite plain in comparison. Um, the ikat that she's sitting on and these lovely cool colors, um, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, I'm going to buy meters of that. If you see something that you like for sale, I would say get it because um, they don't do tradition, they don't do production runs of sort of evergreen patterns. It, what, what's available um, changes and uh, you're not likely to, to see it again. So if you see something you like, get it. The process for those of you um, who are not familiar with sericulture, the cocoons are boiled um, and then you can't really see it in this image. Here you can see where they begin to separate out um, the strands and when they first pull them they're not individual strands. It takes um, numerous go rounds for that to be accomplished. In, the, in being in one of these rooms, it's rather muggy and um, the aroma of the, the cooking cocoons, it's, it's not particularly appetizing, I guess I'll say it that way. So a few more images where they're winding, they use um, the, this, I'm having trouble thinking of it, but the wheel um, to help begin to collect the strands. And again, here, these have dried out, but this, this here probably represents, um, I'm gonna guess maybe about 30 to 40 strands of silk. So it will still need to be separated, but it's wound um, at this length and then tied off. So ECOT design and production, um, first of all, the yarns are measured onto um, a spindle like this. And this distance from side to side, that is going to be the distance of the repeat in the ECOT design. So another image of it when the spindles are full. Once they have been measured and tied, they then are attached here to these rods so that they can be stretched out and then placed on a frame like this so that the design can be applied. Um, they tend to use um, an organic paste to make the design something that will wash out in, in the process. Often they'll take traditional designs, historical designs. Um, the things that are currently produced now are not as complex as the times during this um, era of the emirs, uh, partly because much of what is produced is for export um, and that the, the more complex the design, the more time consuming it is for the production. It's also a number of the um, designers, fashion designers in Uzbekistan, um, they actually design their own ikats and have them, have them um, produced specifically for their, for their lines. So here you're seeing as it is laid, as he's beginning to lay it out, once it has been pulled out, you have some initial winding done here. So the first winding will be to um, have a resist and the first color will show. And for those of you who follow this, you will recognize that each successive dyeing may require um, a different kind unbinding and then rebinding um, to achieve a different second and then third color um, and protecting the first round. Um, it's, the, it's 
for me, it's um, mental gymnastics to imagine how they can take a complex design and tie and retie to get third, fourth, fifth, and sixth colors. Um, it, is a, it is a tremendous artwork. Um, and it's still commonly practiced in, in villages and individual homes. It's not something that people will say, oh, well, everything is produced in the Fergana Valley. It's true that there is a lot of production there, but a lot of it does take place um, in individual homes. This is a Soviet era winding machine, um, which was a tremendous um, assist. Um, and these machines have been in use since the 40s and 50s, um, and since the um, breakup of the Soviet Republic. Um, they are not being replaced, but they are um, continually fixed and, uh, um, and sort of jerry-rigged so that they'll work. Back here, you can see some of these strands in the different stages. It's really important that all of the bundles on, on these rods stay in order. I'm sorry, I keep flipping this around. My mouse is um, teasing me here. So, um, and kids learn quite, quite early. The children of the women um, and men who work at this factory um, come in and after school, they'll, I don't know why this is happening, um, will learn and do the wrapping and the rewrapping. And again, you see some wonderful examples of the different patterns. Here again, Hanks in different stages. Um, some of these, just this is part of the idiosyncrasy, but you know, this is fire prevention um, and management. So here's sand for putting out fire buckets, and they do have a couple of older, um, forgetting the word there. Um, I also like that they have printed um, some of the designs on the doors. These are the traditional hand looms. And when this photograph was taken, there wasn't much work going on. Um, it really depends on the orders that they get in. Um, and in preparation for tourist season, um, you'll see more going on. The particular time we were there, it was also, I think, um, a break time as well. But you see that they're, they're beautifully decorated. Um, and here you get an idea that you have the design <clears throat> that is on the warp and then either cotton or silk is used as the weft um, and that determines the value and the type of ikat, either adras or atlas. Now, they also have old Soviet weaving machines um, the noise of them is, is positively deafening. Um, it does allow for the production of a slightly wider yardage. Um, and you're able to see on the selvage edge, it's, it's a much more even edge because of the machine production. They still, they still use these um, and it depends on the specific market and if this is if it's being done um, for a particular type of, of purchaser. Um, there are not as many of them. And I don't know if the president Mirza Yoyev's um, economic development plan includes um, getting newer and, and larger machines. But here again, you get the idea. Um, of sort of the scope of what they have. And obviously the um, operator has left their glasses taking a break. The chapan, the, this, this garment um, was really ubiquitous during the era of the emirs. And it was a way of showing off wealth and um, status. Formerly, um, each year the emir would pick a particular pattern and set of colors. And so 
all the royalty would then want to go get that and sort of show their affinity. Um, there are much, this is a museum piece. There are much um, lesser versions and even plain chapans um, were worn. It was it, just the fanciness sort of indicate, indicated your, your status um, in the imperial structure. And here I just have a series of some, these again are older pieces and patterns that are quite exquisite in at the Museum of Applied Arts in um, Tashkent, you'll see some just incredible samples of just remarkable color. This is a contemporary collection of scarves. Um, and obviously these are not all organic dyes, um, but there's again, a full, a full range of, of color and, and pattern and quality. I'm showing this because this is the, these are examples of the ecots that are popular um, with, with the Uzbeks. They like a much more vibrant um, palette and um, at some of the markets, you will see um, largely these kinds of colors, but there, there are other sources where you can get things that are a bit more muted or a bit more contemporary for the Westerner. They also produce carpets in Uzbekistan using silk. And, you know, it's again, they tend for those to use the natural dyes. I'm just gonna point out that my dogs have finished their chews that I got them so that they would be quiet. So if there's some barking, it's, it's not me having an epileptic fit. Um, so again, here we have some samples of this. And then they have the workshops there and there are workshops throughout Uzbekistan um, where they produce knotted silk um, carpets in a variety of different patterns. Here they obviously are seeing the details of the different areas that they work on. This is a sample here from the um, silk carpet workshop in Kiva. Um, it's, it's rather famous. It was the subject of a carpet ride to Kiva, um, a book that was written in the 19, I think it was in the 1980s or just after the 1980s. At any rate, a young Englishman who spent time in Kiva helping to revive um, silk textile production. Their patterns are unique. They focus on the tile patterns of Kiva as well as the door, the wood carving patterns of Kiva. Now, Suzani um, was the thing that really captured me on my first trip to Turkey. Um, I was familiar with embroidery, but I had never seen um, Suzani and was quite taken with it. And um, this again is a demonstration at the Yudgorlik Silk Factory where she's using a frame and a tambour hook um, to make the embroidery pattern. There are a variety of patterns um, that you'll learn about on the trip that can identify both the region where it was produced and um, some talismans um, or images that um, warrant um, good luck or fortune. Historically, the Suzanis were made by um, young brides, or I should say engaged women, um, preparing their dowry. And it was said that as they prepared these um, pieces, whether they were wall hangings or tablecloths or bed coverings, cushion covers, that they were stitching their dreams. And so in, in some areas, you'll see that there's a chicken is prominent or a chili is prominent. The chili is thought to ward off bad luck. 
Um, so the range of colors and patterns is spectacular and you'll see them um, through, throughout your trip. So this is an example um, from Bukhara, um, from the Amir's Summer Palace. And it's just a spectacular piece. Um, one would look at it and my first thought was, well, you've got this blank space, perhaps this is used for prayer. Um, this is you know, a largely Muslim country. Um, and in fact, we were informed that, well, no, actually, this is the um, bridal undersheet. And after the, initial, the honeymoon act is consummated, it could be hung out the window with the blood on it to show that it in fact been consummated and she was in fact a virgin, which is, yeah, it's, um, it's actually done the night of the wedding. Um, so all the revelers there can see it. So just a little cultural note there. I don't think that this is in practice anymore. Um, so this is a historic piece. It's just a stunning, stunning piece. There are a few more examples. Um, there are not that many that you find that have been done on a, a colored background. This piece is entirely stitched, all of the pattern, and these are pomegranates. Um, this is a needle stitch. So in addition to the tambour, there is also um, straight needle embroidery. So the word Suzani comes from the Persian word needle, um, and that's the origin of it. Um, whoopsie, whoopsie, I wanted to go back because I've got a couple of other. This is an up close image of needle embroidery. So this stitch is um, similar to a Bukhara couching stitch where the stitches are overlaid a long piece of thread. And this is very fine where you can see the shading and the color. Um, and it, you know, the, the amount of work that goes into this. You'll also see is the seam here. Um, because whether the background material is silk or cotton, it's never wide enough for a large piece. So the pieces are initially stitched together, the design is drawn, and then multiple people may actually end up working on the piece. So sometimes you will see differences um, across the seam in, in color. Um, and the piece that's behind me um, is, is similar. Okay, um, we're now on to the paper production here. And this is um, outside of Samarkand. And one of the, this is a family that has really maintained, um, well, reintroduced um, and promulgated the traditional um, art of producing paper from the mulberry branches. And it was, at the time of the printing press, one of the advantages of this paper was that unlike papyrus, it could be printed on both sides. And it really became the paper of favor um, for the production of Quran and other important documents. One of the things that is unique at this is that they actually have a stream running by and the water is, is really important in um, the, the production as you'll see. It's a little difficult to see in this photograph, but these are bundles of the branches from the mulberry trees um, that are ready to be to be boiled and they're boiled and boiled um, as they get softened. They're initially stripped of the bark and um, thin quiet, sorry about that. Um, and the, they're boiled until they're, they're completely soft. After that, um, the power of a, um, a mill that's basically um, generated through the stream pounds these into a pulp. Um, it's rather ingenious the way they have it, they have it set up. 
Um, you can see here, there are va various um, forms that are used to pull the, the pounded pulp out of the water bath. One of the things that's the, very unique about the paper is that they use um, stone to rub and rub and rub and to polish the paper so that it is very, very fine and non-absorbent. Um, and it is still um, in high demand for um, custom Quran. Um, although one wonders how much longer that will last since so much everything is, is online now. This is considered one of the oldest Quran um, in the world and it resides in um, a mosque in Tashkent. It's something that you'll, you'll get to see. Um, let's see. Um, at the at the mill, they also produce these very charming puppets. They also produce these masks, um, and they have different note cards and and things that you can purchase. Um, and really, at this point, um, this one particular spot is the only place in Uzbekistan that is still producing by hand. And so the process is. Um, equally important for the production of the high-end paper that's um, used for the Qurans and also for, for tourism. And plus the masks are used in various celebrations. The silkworm pupae, okay, so we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, it's very highly degradable, but there's so much of it in silk producing areas, it actually can cause serious environmental problems. Um, and so Uzbekistan is, does and is increasingly using pupae for feed or food, but for oils um, and in any way to help reduce this impact. Um, it, you can see I did a little search and it's used here for fish. They have special um, products for rodents and even for hedgehogs. Um, I like that it's soft and moist farm raised, um, but it's also eaten by people. And interestingly, um, more prominently by people of Korean descent. Um, so these images are all from Korea. Again, it's supposedly, I've read about it and people have said, you know, it, it's, I guess, a bit like tofu in that it takes on the flavor of whatever is used to produce it. Um, and I gather if it's produced, if it's prepared properly, um, the texture isn't, isn't really off-putting. And it's something I guess all of us in the world are going to have to get used to um, as we look at other forms of protein that don't degrade the environment. Now, one of the reasons I brought this up is that most people don't know that there is a not insignificant Korean population in Central Asia and specifically Uzbekistan. Um, the history of this is that the Koreans in the 18th and 1900s, 18th century, 19th, they fled poverty as well as Japanese oppression by migrating north to Vladivostok in far Eastern Russia. In the 30s, um, as Stalin came to power in Russia, um, their alliances with Japan were frayed and Stalin, as he grew more um, paranoid, be became fearful that the Koreans could be spies that would infiltrate Russian intelligence. So along with all of the other deportations that Stalin ordered, and um, they sent a lot of European Russians to Central, Asians, Central Asia um, to wait out the war. Um, and so that had obviously a big impact on the formation of the um, Soviet Socialist Republic. So in the late 30s, 172,000 ethnic Koreans were forcibly deported in cattle cars. 
Um, it was brutal. Um, you can see, you know, 40,000 people perished. You know, they were promised that they were going to go farm and have a wonderful agricultural life. They were basically um, dumped into the steppe. And this is not like the Mongolian steppe. This is, you know, dry, difficult desert. Um, the Uzbeks took them in and helped them learn to farm, um, often using them as labor, um, but also teaching them. Um, and they did acquire a, um, a reasonable standard living within about one generation. Today, there's about half a million ethnic Russians, uh, ethnic Koreans living in Russia um, and Kazakhstan. Um, but there's a, as well as, as Kyrgyzstan um, and Tajikistan, I don't think that many made it to Turkmenistan. So when you go to the markets, um, all of the open air markets, you'll see um, the Korean areas, which are filled with different kinds of kimchi, different noodles. Um, and since I learned about the silk worms, which I hadn't been aware of them before, um, the next time I'm there, I am going to look to see if they are producing them as food. Um, and I will say now that I will gamely try them. So um, I'm almost immediately sorry I said that, but I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stick with it. This is the Chorsu Bazaar in Tashkent. It's enormous. It's fascinating. Um, you'll spend a fair amount of time there. So on that, I say Nastrobia. Um, that's the... Um, I guess the, the cheer of, of when you take your shot of vodka and this is zero harmful impurities, a unique vodka um, that's actually a um, pr product from Kyrgyzstan, um, but you do wanna be careful. And if you're gonna have vodka in Uzbekistan, make sure it's Russian. So with that, I will sign off and I will, well, let me look at questions. Let's see. Okay. You know, I am so going to hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so let's see. The maybe, maybe these are the, uh, the, the crunchy ones that you eat together with, um, you, you eat together with your uh, vodka, you know, as we That's consume. Or after, after, you, after your vodka, that would help a lot. So, um, so I'm yes, the to silkworms, um, going through the questions here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The silkworms are, are boiled alive. Um, although it's possible that in transit, um, they're not all alive um, by the time they get there. Um, someone says, where are the pupa for lunch? Well. I think we just answered that. We're going to have to look for them. That was from Barbara. Barbara, if you're on that trip, you can taste them with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, Judith. Yes, she's saying that. Thank you, Judith. Um, so so the others... only, um, I'll, I'll just interject here, the, the, the only silk that's not, uh, where they don't boil the silkworms alive is the airy silk that you find in Assam in India mm -hmm. and that is called that is called the peace silk because the, the pupa they wait until the the the uh, you know the, the fly off before yeah. they start boiling them. So yeah that's the only one but otherwise all silks are uh, inherently they do boil the yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah well the silk worms. Go ahead. Now let's see I am new to this. Are there I I write, oh, that's ECOT families, okay, because I'm very familiar with that spell check correction that you had, have to do about three times before it lets you say ECOT. Um, you know, so Suzanne is asking about, um, you know, are there families, are patterns passed down? How do they learn? Um, a lot of it is passed down um, and a craft that's learned at home. But increasingly there are people, one of the things is interesting and one of the designers um, that you may visit in Tashkent, um, the, the ikat was really lost um, or really, I guess, sort of 
um, in suspension during the Soviet socialist era um, because there was so much effort on infrastructure. This was time consuming, um, you know, and there wasn't a great market for it. Um, and a lot of the fine older pieces, you know, were bought by tourists for collections, were put into museums. Um, and it was from a group of really um, younger designers who had some familiarity of what was happening in the West who said, hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. Um, so, so they are being taught now, um, I believe, in some of the textile schools that are run. Um, and then they have the books so that they can be reproduced um, that way as well. There are also, when um, it's not there are families of patterns so that you can identify there's um, a particular style that's um, would indicate that it's from Bukhara. There's other that would indicate it's from parts of the Fergana Valley. And we'll learn more about that on the tour as well. Um, another question here is what percentage of ikat yarg on the market in Uzbekistan is hand woven versus machine woven? Um, that's kind of hard. I can't, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I will look and see if I can, if I can find that out. Um, I, I did stick my neck out there, uh, Carolyn's question. I, I said, I'm not sure whether there is like per se, uh, like a machine woven ikat or, or yeah. what, what was the photograph that we saw? You said it was a Russian machine from the 40s? Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's I mean, that's a machine woven. Oh, um, okay. So, but yeah. I, I, tend to, I tend to think those are simpler designs and they're made um, that way so that they are less expensive. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of my guess. Okay, so yeah, Carolyn, my apologies. Yeah, I got that wrong. Yeah. All right, carry on. Mm -hmm. I think so, that was... I'm not seeing any other questions here. Yeah, any other questions, everybody? Or are you all, all good? Yeah, ready to buy? I got a question from Barbara. Barbara's asking, do you buy the ikat by the meter or by the piece? And I said, when we go to the markets in, um, uh, you know, Ugut, uh, uh, we do buy them by the meter and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, yeah, so yeah, we've got lots of, yeah, lots of yeah. ikat yardage from there. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm going to, if you like, uh, if there's no more questions, I'll uh, I just unmute everybody. And uh, uh, if you like, we can have a little bit of a forum.